Finally, after a long two year waiting period, we have finally been able to see Top Gun Maverick in theaters. And let me just tell you, it did not disappoint. So in this video, I'm gonna be giving you my perspective as an aerospace engineer about the scientific and engineering principles found in the movie Top Gun Maverick. And like I've done in my previous Engineer Reacts videos, I'm gonna be giving Top Gun Maverick my rating on how Top Gun Maverick adheres to engineering and scientific principles. And of course, before we get into anything, I'm gonna give you the obligatory spoiler warning. I will be talking about everything in this movie. So just like in the original Top Gun, we are right away treated with the aircraft carrier montage of fighter jets taking off and landing on aircraft carriers. And it, of course, does not disappoint. In previous videos, I've talked at length about the US Navy's Air Force and how incredible of a feat it is to land and take off from a boat. So after watching the Navy's Finest, we then jump over to see what Maverick's up to. And then we're introduced to what's called the Dark Star Program. So basically what's happening here is Maverick is a test pilot for this program called Dark Star. Now Dark Star in the context of this film is essentially a hypersonic manned vehicle that's meant to be this test platform for proving hypersonic technology. So I've already made a couple of videos talking about the difference between supersonic and hypersonic jets. And if you wanna check those out, make sure you check out my channel. But for the sake of this video, hypersonic is basically anything that is over Mach 5 or five times the speed of sound and faster. So this is actually really on the cutting edge of where we are as far as aerospace technology right now. A lot of our technology and a lot of R&D research is going into hypersonic technologies right now because that's what we see in the news all the time about Russia developing hypersonic weapons. I made another video about that as well. China has a new hypersonic weapon. North Korea says that they're also testing hypersonic weapons. It's really the cutting edge of where aerospace is headed towards the future. And the US military is specifically interested in hypersonic research, especially in hypersonic air breathing engines. And an air breathing engine, for those of you who don't know, is just a specific type of engine used on aircraft that uses the incoming air to provide thrust to the aircraft. Another really cool thing about this Dark Star program in this film is that they actually partnered up with a very famous entity of Lockheed Martin called Skunk Works. This is the division of Lockheed Martin that works on research and development into very advanced programs. They develop things such as the SR-71, the F-117. They have a long history of developing incredibly advanced aerospace technologies. So I thought it was really cool as an aerospace engineer to see them represented in this film in such a prominent way. Like I mentioned in my supersonic jet engine video, there are specific types of engines that are meant to reach different speeds. So just like the SR-71, the Dark Star seems to be designed in a way that the engine can actually change geometry in order to meet its flight condition. This is the SR-71 Blackbird, and this is its inlet spike. This inlet spike was actually adjustable so that the airplane could adjust to where the supersonic shockwave was gonna be inside the engine so that it could reconfigure itself to go different speeds. Changing the effective engine type from a turbojet into a ramjet. Now a ramjet can go much faster than a turbojet, so that was needed for much higher speeds to allow the aircraft to go up to Mach 3 like the SR-71 could. However, the ramjet by itself couldn't get the aircraft up to speed at low speeds and needed to go supersonic before the ramjet could really go into full effect. Now we see in the movie that Dark Star relies on a very similar principle when Maverick says that he's switching over to scramjet. What he means is whatever type of engine or geometry of engine that was being used to get up to supersonic speeds, he then is switching the engines to go into a supersonic combustion ramjet known as a scramjet. Now scramjets are specifically designed to take supersonic airflow and combust that airflow. So there's no moving parts inside of the engine. The air comes in at supersonic speeds and goes even higher supersonic speeds out to provide thrust to the aircraft. In fact, so much thrust that Maverick is able to reach high supersonic speeds, which is considered generally to be Mach 10 and above. He's specifically told 
not to go higher than Mach 10, but also not go below Mach 10 because they need to be classified as high supersonic in order to fulfill their contract requirements. The reason why you don't wanna push it past a certain point is because as soon as you have the slightest of disturbance in the inlet that can cause a disruption in that combustion process, you can have an easy engine flame out and this can cause an incredible imbalance of the aircraft, which can be unrecoverable. And in the case of this one, like Maverick is shown here, as soon as he had the engine flame out for going much faster than Mach 10, like he was told not to, he gets the engine flame out and from there, he likely enters an unrecoverable spin and is unable to recover the most likely multi-million, if not billion dollar airplane. What did it cost? Billions and- And if Maverick should learn anything from this little misadventure, he should learn that as much as he ignores his superiors, he should not ever ignore the engineers. So I really did like this scene because this really is the type of technology that we're researching currently in the industry and we're pushing towards. Now, whether or not we actually have this technology is for the comment section to debate, but I will say that this scene repeats the pattern of the first movie and continues the pattern in this movie of Maverick doing things that are incredibly unrealistic as far as a military standard. You are still dangerous. But there's pretty much no way that he's walking away from this stunt of his with his wings. So another theme that shows up throughout this movie is this manned versus unmanned aircraft battle in the military. This is something that has been long debated within the military community. Should we have manned fighter jets? And are we there with the technology to completely replace the fighter pilot? And the technology is getting to the point where at least we're gonna have drone wingman along with a manned aircraft plane as well. And we're also gonna have something that's called optionally manned, where you'll have a manned aircraft built that can either be flown by a pilot or from the ground as well. I think that's kind of the medium that we're gonna go with for the time being. Of course, most of the military debate is whether or not it's worth it to put a human at risk and can a human actually perform better than a drone can. I'll let you guys debate that in the comments, but overall, I really appreciate that they touch on the subject because it really is where the military is leaning towards. So after this fiasco with Dark Star, he somehow gets orders to still go and be an instructor at Top Gun. Which brings us to the main mission of the whole plot. Basically, not Iran is enriching uranium to build a nuclear weapon, and they have to go in and destroy that site. But they have to keep below the radar, literally, and avoid the surface-to-air missiles, or SAMs, as we've discussed in other videos. But in order to achieve this, they have to pull incredibly high-G maneuvers and push themselves and their aircrafts literally to the limits. So we finally reach the point of the main mission, we're finally gonna enter enemy airspace and neutralize the threat. Which brings us to our main enemy combatants, which I also really appreciated the inclusion of, the Su-57. Now this is also a point of concern for many military analysts who think that maybe our fifth gen fighters or the fighter jets that have stealth technology may be neutralized by the fact that Russia and China and many of our near peer adversaries have technologies sufficient enough to at least detect some of our fifth generation fighters. Now this might completely neutralize our fifth generation fighters, especially when we talk about the fact that fifth generation fighters are also starting to enter service in China and in Russia as well. Which begs the question, is our fifth generation fighter fleet sufficient against the near peer adversary? Or does it even matter anymore? Should we go back to our fourth generation fighters, which are much, much cheaper to develop? Or do we stick with the much costlier stealth technology because it may give us a slight advantage? But there's another thing that I really admire about this movie. It's the adversary in the film, the Su-57. And since this is the first time I'm bringing up the Su-57 on my channel, I'm gonna actually add it to our overall aircraft rankings. Now in the film, this aircraft is introduced to be a much far superior aircraft than the F-18 Super Hornet. And there are aspects that are certainly superior than the F-18, namely the fact that this is a fifth generation fighter, which means it incorporates stealth technology, whereas the F-18 only has limited stealth capabilities, only slightly better than the F-18 Hornet. 
Now something else that is actually on dramatic display is something called super maneuverability. Now this is actually an aspect of aircraft in Russia that is actually slightly better than what we have here in the United States. Super maneuverability is the concept where basically you can take the aircraft and change its direction on a dime. I mean, it is absolutely astounding to watch. However, the US has taken a totally different approach and we basically haven't even strived towards this capability. But theoretically, it can be an incredible advantage in a slow, close air-to-air -air combat situation. Now, the reason that the US hasn't developed super maneuverability in their aircraft is because the US military has prioritized long standoff ranges, specifically beyond visual range. For instance, if you're in a dogfight between F-22 and the Su-57, the F-22 is gonna fire before it even sees the S-57. So you can do all the super maneuverability that you want, but if you're 20 miles out from the F-22 and the F-22 is already firing at you, then it really doesn't matter what kind of maneuvers you do. That being said, in this movie, we're actually able to see what's called super maneuverability in those Russian aircraft. And it's especially on display because you are actually in a close air-to-air, -air, slow speed dogfight, which is pretty cool to see on film. And I actually really appreciate it because if you noticed in the previous Top Gun, they did not use any Russian aircraft because they actually used American aircraft, which they called a MiG, but it was actually just an F-5. But without any further ado, let's go ahead and put up the Su-57 on our aircraft ranking list. First for cost, as all Russian aircrafts on this list, I don't really have the most reliable of data, but from what I can find, it seems to be about $100 million. So it gets about a four being pretty costly, but for what you're getting, it doesn't sound like that bad of a price. I don't really believe the price. And for speed, I give it an eight because it does have super cruise maneuverabilities reportedly, and it actually is pretty quick. And for versatility, give it a seven because it is designed to be a multi-row aircraft. It includes a fair amount of external and internal stores and overall seems like a pretty decent aircraft based on stats alone. For innovation, it is a very innovative aircraft, especially for being the first fifth generation fighter to come out of Russia. But I will say it does seem to lag behind some of the innovations of even the F-22 and it is much, much newer than the F-22 as well. And for effectiveness, unfortunately, it's gonna have to get a three because as much money as the Russians have thrown at this program and as much as they like to tout this as the end all be all of fifth generation fighters, it actually hasn't proven itself in pretty much any theater. Even though there's only been a handful of these developed some of them are still in testing phase and the ones that are actually in operation are still not even being used, even where they would seem to be very important in a role such as Ukraine, which begs the question, are they truly effective as they like to say? So overall, I'm giving this airplane a 5.95 on my ultimate aircraft ranking list, putting it in 18th place right above the A-10 Thunderbolt. So overall, I know this is not a film review, but I've really, really enjoyed Top Gun Maverick. They seem to strike an incredible balance of nostalgia and with an actual real plot that wasn't just a remake of the old movie or a rehashing of the same plot. I really did enjoy it. And I really feel like Top Gun really is a love letter to aviation, even in a modern era where it seems like the future of fighter pilots and these things may not be so bright but it still really hits home. And I really appreciate all the work that was done. And so many of the shots were done practically, and there's not very much CGI in the film, of course, with the exception of the Russian jets. And for me, the most unbelievable parts of this movie were really just Maverick being a Maverick, just like the first one, where he did these insane stunts that would absolutely get him kicked out of the military. But as far as my ranking of Top Gun Maverick's adherence to engineering principles, I gotta say, I could probably give it an A. It really is a very incredibly well-researched and well-crafted story. Like I said, it really is an incredible tribute to aerospace and to the US Navy and all these things. And I really don't have any complaints. 
I mean, of course, they take some liberties as far as the military protocol and Maverick being a rebel and those types of things. But honestly, for a film this good, I'm going to give it a pass. So I appreciate this movie. I hope you appreciated this review. And if you want to continue learning about more aerospace engineering principles, make sure you subscribe to the channel or check